I think we'll get started with uh, this uh, class of lecture. Uh, Jerry Sylvie, uh, about everybody's favorite, P values. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a reason why this talk is at 5 o'clock in the in Friday afternoon. I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so the thing I'll do is uh, first uh, uh, go through quickly um, a, a talk I gave in, uh, in Singapore, a quick talk. Uh, and, and please make it more like, a, you know, uh, interactive and, uh, and ask questions. Uh, I'll go through that quickly. And then I've got a series of notebooks. All the notebooks are, I'll show you when I'm finished with that. Uh, so, uh, so this is the problem associated with the abuse of p-values in brain imaging and their effect on reproducibility. Um, uh, so I'll do a little bit of a definition, quick, uh, quick uh, historical perspective, uh, then uh, go through the UNEDIS uh, little uh, sort of a, uh, way of thinking, uh, and then you know what is what are the problems and what's the other solution. Uh, so uh, a p-value, for those who don't know is the probability of observing a statistic equal to the one seen in the data or more uh, or one that is more extreme when the null hypothesis is true okay that sounds like a simple definition right no okay let's go for it. Okay. so you need to know what is the null you need to choose a statistic you have the concept of repeating the whole study the same way, uh, like a large number of times within that you know, sort of definition. You have to have that concept that this is something that will happen, like uh, this experiment that you're doing is going to be repeated in your mind, like in you know, a, a really number of times, with the same study design, with the same sampling scheme, with the same definition of the statistic. And basically, I think it would be fair to say that you know, very few people actually have all those concepts in their mind. And, uh, and while we don't have all those concepts in our mind, I mean, maybe some of you have, they have like a proper training in statistics, whatever. Everybody is using a p-value. Most of the stuff that is being published is being published through p-values, and only if a p-value is less than you know, 0.05 or something. And I think that's a major factor, at least in a, a biological uh, or you know life science uh, uh, publication, and also like a pre uh, or a clinical sociology, uh, uh, psychology, all those uh, sort of like a, it's absolutely a major factor in why we have a problem in terms of the reproducibility of our experiments. And reproducibility, problem of reproducibility, you know that. Uh, so like, uh, you know, uh, this is one, uh, one you know, slide that, you know, describing a few of those key papers that have uh, you know, dis described the problem. So, so the question is, um, you know, how is the p-value really impacting our reproducibility? Uh, so reproducibility actually is not the probably the right term. And you've, you know, I think you have uh, Rust talking about that, hopefully. I mean, I wasn't here on Monday, but uh, uh, reproducibility is really more like the computational issue. It's when you have like a, uh, you know, you need to use Docker and uh, and Git and all those things, and, and then you can actually reproduce your your analysis or someone else's analysis. Uh, that's that's really to me on the you know on the side of the computation. The real problem is the replicability problem. So and that's a statistical issue. And replicability is. That when you're trying to get another sample with like another like a 550 subjects doing about the same thing, something very similar, you would expect to find this about the same results, and that unfortunately is often way way too often not the case. I mean, first of all, it's not very studied uh, because it's hard and costly, and nobody is interested, or you know, few people are you know take the effort, make the effort to do it, but uh, when it is, it is often not the case. So, uh, so why the p-value is a problem in that sort of process? Um, well, first of all, there's a large body of works that is actually quite old, uh, stating that you know the uh, the p.05 is actually weak evidence, and I'll show you, uh, I think, a couple of uh, figures for that. Then there's UNEDIS theoretical arguments. I mean, you, how many of you have read uh, UNEDIS 2005? Uh, why must research findings are false? 
So it's, it's basically most of you, I mean like maybe half of you. So for, for the other half who haven't read that paper, it's absolutely critical to read and understand that paper. And hopefully if we have time, I'll go through the, how to, do you derive what is the positive predictive value. So you need this theoretical argument is, we, uh, like, you know, we, we, we actually, we, what is interesting in an experiment is the probability that, you know, if uh, the, the test is, uh, is significant, that the experiment will, the, the, the hypothesis will be, uh, you know, proven to be true. And that's the, and, you know, and through, that, through his papers, is, through his paper, he's actually showing that, you know, that's very, that we have like a very uh, uh, low uh, positive predictive value. So that, that positive predictive values that we define is the thing that he's studying and he's showing that most likely most of our results are actually false. So statistic is, I mean, like the p-value in itself is not a problem. Like it's like, a, I would say, okay, a gun in itself is not a problem. It's how you use it, right? <laughs> and what do you do with it? And uh, so statistic is really what is, it's not like the, the p-value itself is, you know, it's, it's just, a, you know, number uh, and, and an indicator of something. It's really like the, the practice of statistic and how you use that thing. And I don't know, I mean, you know, Bizarrely, the the whole science body and like a large part of the scientific body went to the fact that you know you have to take that number and make sure that that number is smaller than a, a certain value to be able to publish things, and that's really bad practice of statistic, and that's you know like that's you know mostly taken by people who have, I mean like more like a superficial knowledge of what what is a p-value. And they, you know, they, they basically they are following the guidelines of uh, editors and publishers and like all those uh, and the journals. And you know, you just, you know, you just can't get something out if there's no statistical significance. Statistical significance has, I mean, not nothing to do with, but is not the same as biological or you know, uh, significance. You may have like a, a non-significant statistical significant result and something that is biologically very interesting and the opposite is true as well. And there are a number of studies showing that uh, uh, if you look at, you know, how, you know, researchers are using those, uh, those, those this tool, the p-value tool, then, you know, they, it's clear that, you know, the, the tool is not used very well. Uh, I mean, I've, I'm citing here two papers. Uh, you should really see and read the, uh, the Siemens and Siemens in psychology paper, 2011, if my memory is correct. That paper is really the sort of like, a, you know, a, was a little bit of a wake-up call uh, for the psychology uh, fields on the p-hacking aspect. So some uh, quick uh, analytical evidence, like uh, no, this is one paper, uh, altered brain activity in unipolar depression revisited meta-analysis of neuroimaging studies. So looking at, you know, like a good group doing meta-analysis and serious, uh, serious statistic uh, people, so during the past 20 years, numerous neuroimaging experiments have been investigated aberrant brain activation during cognitive and emotional processing in patients with unipolar depression, right? The result of that study, like uh, in you know, 57 studies, 99 individual neuroimaging experiments, almost you know, 100, 1,000 patients, all, all those things. Overall, analysis across cognitive processing, and across emotional processing reveal no significant results. So it means like all those you know, papers, you know, if you take the, you know, the sort of like, what is the evidence across all those things, there's, I mean, we, we don't know, right? It doesn't mean that you know, there's nothing, or like, uh, it just means that we don't have the evidence, the statistical evidence for that, for that something is happening. All food cause cancer, that was a kind of a quirky and, uh, and, and funny way of uh, showing the problem. Um, they took uh, uh, 264 single study. Uh, 72 of percent of those concluded that the tested food associated was an increase or decrease of uh, cancer, of a uh, risk of cancer. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, the, uh, the most of those studies uh, had a weak uh, or very small evidence. And the meta-analysis, uh, like, uh, showed that you know only a very little amount of possible, you know, like, food would actually uh, increase or decrease the risk of cancer. So, so n equal four instead of uh, n equal uh, one hundred and three. So it's about five percent, right? <laughs> um, so, 
so I mean, so there is a real problem, and I think I think that that week, those two weeks are you know, kind of like a, almost like a response to the, from the community to say, okay, we we can't go on that way forever. That's not possible. And the problem actually started very very early when the actual p value was introduced by Fisher, and the and that you know and at that time. At the, almost at the time it was the p-value was defined, the uh, people started to say, hey, you know, that's not an actual, that's, that's something we should, we should be careful about. And then there was, um, you know, so there was the Fisher conception that, you know, it's an indication about some, something about the data under, uh, under the null. And then there's a Neyman person conception that is actually a proper, you know, mathematically well-defined conception of the p-value. Uh, that is a really a decision rule. It doesn't really matter what is the value of the p-value. It's really whether you, know, you have chosen that you have accepted a certain risk and you're going to accept or not, you know, the hypothesis with that, within that risk. And, and you know, I think, I think in our mind, we, we still have a kind of a very biased Fisherian way of using the p-value in most of the, of the, stati the, the, uh, the, the scientists. And I, I think, you know, I, I, would, I would bet that, you know, most of you, when you're looking at paper and you're saying, oh, p equal, you know, 10 to the minus 5, oh, okay, there must be some strong evidence of, of, of something, right? Uh, but if p is almost 0 0.049, then, you know, that's a... But that's not at all what, how the p-value was supposed to be, you know, is properly used. And, and I think we still have that, that in, a, in, a, you know, in our way. So, because you know, all know what the p-value, and because that's always uh, uh, good to sort of like, uh, you know, revive and like, you know, have that in mind, I'm going to do the uh, Westover test, which is a classic test to you. Uh, so you consider a typical medical research study. Uh, you design to test the efficiency of a drug. Uh, there is a null hepatitis H0, no effect. Uh, it's tested against the alternative H0. There is an effect of the drug. You suppose that the test, the study result, pass a test of statistical significance that is uh, p-value is less than 0.05 in favor of H1. No, so there is an effect. What has been shown? So you'll have to show some hands there, you know. Is it one or two? Who thinks that, you know, it has been shown that the null is false or, and the alternative is true? Nobody? Good. H0 is probably false and H1 is probably true. Who thinks that's the case? One, two, three, four. Five, six. So I think, yeah, about maybe half of the people here, right? Both one and two, both three and four. I think that's uh, you know like a, a kind of a collapse the whole thing, and none of the above. Who think that's absolutely none of the above? Uh, maybe thirty percent. You know, maybe a bit less, twenty percent. So it is none of the above. So it means that you know. You know, you all postdoc PhDs, like you know, having like, you had you used and you were like you were working with the p-values, and uh, and you still don't really know what it means, right? And it, and, and that's just because it's difficult. And it's not your, you know, like it's not. I'm not blaming the, the uh, uh, your education or whatever. It's just it's just a, it is a you know really difficult concept to grasp. So the p-value doesn't give you anything on the probability of the H0 of H1. Right. It does. It just doesn't, and you know, and that has. It's, and that's all the like uh, when you read the UNED's paper, you can you know you sort of like you understand a bit more of that, but it, it just doesn't, and it, it's it's just so hard to think. You know, like it's it's just really like okay, we, we just want that to be right. We we just we just you know okay, that must be the case. It is not. And, maybe, and hopefully I will have like a bit more time to explain you know more in the details of why, but the reason is the why is it's because the the probability of the of the H1 or H0 uh, has to do I mean first of all you have to kind of like uh, think of it as a as a uh, something which has a probability which is like a you know random variable so that's you know you have to think of a, a hypothesis as a random variable which is like you know you know, have to think of okay amongst all those hypotheses you know you know this this body of hypotheses and you have to think of what's the probability of that hypothesis to be in that that space rather than that one and secondly when you think about that 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 object, you have to think of what is the a priori, uh, you know, uh, probability of that of, of a zero. So let's say I see like a cow flying. 
I do an experiment. I find out that you know the uh, you know my p-value is 0.05. That the cow is actually flying. I still have a very low probability that that you know initial hypothesis is true, and the, the probability that the hypothesis is true is still very low at the end of the day, right? And that's because then you have to work in a Bayesian in a Bayesian in your space and Bayesian uh, sort of framework, and you have to think, okay, is my hypothesis really you know plausible to start with and uh, you know uh, you know workable to start with? So. Again, that test was given to um, to medical students, and they basically, I think they, I mean, you know, you're a bit better than them, <laughs> like you know, but it's not, uh, it's not, uh, you know, most people with their will answer three or four, which is, you know, the probability of H0 is probably false, and like H0 is probably false, and uh, and uh, H1 is probably true. And actually, you know, some medical, you know, doctors actually are saying, yeah, okay, this, this is like, a, you know, and you know, it's it's very frightening because the a lot of the of the the way medicine is actually applied and and, and practice uh, is based on those p values and those studies. And like, so it's a, there's a little bit of a frightening aspect to it because you know, yeah, the, it clearly is not understood. Then. Then you have to think about the uh, the uh, the p is significant, but the the power also. Let's let's say you have a p value. You read a paper. Uh, the p value is significant, uh, the, but the power is very low. The power. I mean, I'll go in what, a bit more in what it is. Um, and what what happens when that's uh, what, what that's the situation? Are actually three things. Um, I mean, actually, yeah. At least, I mean. But let's say three things. First of all, power is low. It means that you know you have little chance to find anything. That's the definition of the power. The problem is that power is low. You will get some more inflated effect size. So you'll find you find something because it's uh, significant. You'll have like, an effect size, and that effect size is going to be way above what is act the actual effect size. And and the other thing is that if you look at you know what is the positive predictive value, which is the probability that your hypothesis H1 is true, given that your test is significant, that probability is going to be very low. And I'm go I'm going to go into the why that's the case uh, later. So for instance, let's say you have uh, a power of 0.5, which you know I think Tor was saying you know this is like a classical power, and you have a, a node ratio, which is the you know probability of H1 over the probability of H0 to be 0.2. So, so probably H1 is like, you know, not really, uh, you know, it's not improbable. Like it's, you know, you get a reasonable like a chance. And you wouldn't do a study if H, you know, H1 was completely obvious, right? You know, that's not an interesting study. You would be do, doing an interesting study if H1 is a little bit okay. Uh, you know, the alternative is something that, you know, you don't, you, you clearly you, you you have a chance that is that's not true because that's interesting, right? You believe it's true, but you know it, it doesn't. You know, so that's with that odd ratio, uh, and again that's a prior on on the hypothesis. So uh, you know, uh, the positive predictive value, which is this probability of H1 to be true given the test is significant, is uh, with uh, uh, alpha equal 0.05. You know, would be like, uh, for instance, uh, power 0.5 was going to be, you know, something like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, which is not too bad. Uh, fine. Now, as soon as power becomes like, uh, you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.2, which is, you know, and, and I think Thor was saying that, you know, a lot of the power is about, I think he was saying something like 5%, right? Uh, that's maybe true in like some aspects, but like, yeah. As soon as that, that is happening, either because your alpha, your, 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 your risk of error is going to be very high, or like very stringent, or because uh, you've got uh, a very few subjects, or you know, for a number of reasons, the, this probability is going to go to draw into 0 0.4, 0 0.3, like you know, that. So there's very little chance that you get you know, that, that H1 to be, uh, to be actually true, uh, given that the test is uh, significant. That is a very key figure, and if you haven't seen it before, like, you know, please look at that carefully. This is uh, it's, it's, it's getting to be old already, but um, this is the effect size, and I'll define that you know, the, uh, you know, what, whatever you're measuring and you want to, uh, to prove. And this is a year of publication, and the, and the circles here are the size of the cohort of the, uh, of the, uh, of the studies. And that's uh, the um, meta-analysis of the uh, relationship between BDNF, the uh, 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 mutation of BDNF and the uh, hippocampal volume. So how much the, the you know your uh, BDNF uh, uh, allele is actually impacting your hippocampal volume. You start with like a, 
there is also a little bit over, over, all over the place. So there's one, one study that shows this is nothing. Uh, one study shows like a point six, point almost point uh, one, and so on, like a point uh, six again or something. And then you know the effect size start to number of studies start to you know increase, but the effect size start, the, the the sample size start to be uh, bigger, and then eventually you know you kind of think okay, there's there's probably a, no effect at all, right? And that's you know between 2004 and 2000, let's say 2012. Yeah. Which means you know that uh, we spent like there was a large number of like uh, you know small st like small studies uh, showing some effects being published and and not being and eventually when you get some like larger uh, sample size you don't get anything, which is scary uh, because it's costly for society and. Uh, not everybody believes in power. Like uh, you get sometimes the uh, response to okay, uh, you have to do a power analysis, but you know also get some uh, grant reviewers saying, oh, you want to work on power, but you know anything that is interesting is actually by definition an an unknown, and if it's unknown, you don't have an effect size, and if you don't have an effect size, you can't actually compute power. Okay, why? Well, well, I think that's a crazy <laughs> way of thinking, but it does happen that you know people think like this way. Uh, that's a, that is still a problem. So if p is not significant, we get into the uh, uh, classic uh, uh, file draw effect, um, and and that, you know, and one of the key problem in meta analysis is that you're looking at all the studies that have been published, but you don't see the published that, you know, the study that have not been published, and the only way of getting out of that problem, uh, I mean that, you know, first of all, that have been published and we don't know how much of the p-hacking has happened, but, uh, uh, but the only way to uh, get out of that problem is to do some pre-registration and, and say, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to test. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to do some other things to the data, but at least I'm not going to describe uh, some result as, you know, statistically significant, you know, you know hypothesis classic hypothesis testing uh, framework, uh, while that's not the case, uh, which is usually what you find in papers. So uh, this is the, the p-hacking problem, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, and is uh, incredible. Like if you actually play with the numbers, if you do, if you try to understand it, you do the, the, uh, the numbers, it is quite frightening how quickly the risk of error uh, your alpha that you're trying to control, the uh, risk of uh, uh, saying that something is actually, uh, tr I mean, the, the reject rejected the null while it's actually you are under the null. This risk of alpha is actually is getting like very quickly very high, like 50 percent, 30 percent, 80 percent, and that simulation that this was this was a simulation done by first um, uh, getting to from um, from the psychologist. The, uh, the, the researchers actually ask, uh, okay, how do you analyze your data? So there was a survey. What, is, what, what do you do with your data? And, and there was a survey, and, they, and, and like uh, the psychologists, you know, like uh, you know, amongst I, don't, I can't remember the number of uh, you know, researchers in psychology were uh, uh, were surveyed, but but from that survey, they took the most common uh, processing or steps that you know how people were analyzing their data. And then they did some simulation with like uh, uh, absolutely nothing under the null, and say, okay, now let's apply those procedures. Those, you know, th this is how the data are analyzed, you know, using that the result of that survey. So those things here are not like a just okay, you know, this is the uh, what if you know researchers were doing that. That's not. That's what the psychologists are doing on their data right at the time of the uh, of the survey, at least. Scary, again. <laughs> I mean, I won't uh, do that. But we've seen, like, you've seen that uh, thing. That the, the p-hacking aspect can uh, also happen, like, in brain imaging, and in that, in that uh, example, you've got like uh, plenty of uh, uh, possible results depending on the uh, the pipeline. Again, the pipeline here, the pipeline, you know, were taken from the literature by Carp. It was, it's a beautiful study. So coming back to the. Um, to the low, low positive, the uh, positive positive value of uh, UNEDs. If you have p hacking, and actually, if your alpha is not controlled, it's uh, it's not 0.05, but it's something like uh, you know uh, uh, higher. 
the positive predictive value is getting extremely low. So that's that's part of the problem. That's you know that the those those things that we see like in uh, you know are are just completely biased because of those practices uh, being done on the air. So in that case, um, you know like a, you know that's yeah that's I've, I can't remember which uh, alpha was that, but I think it's uh, alpha equal 0.2 something like that, and then you you get that sort of a positive predictive value like 30 percent with a power of 0.5. So that's really happening. Uh, there's another survey that uh, you know uh, identifying bioethical issues in uh, biostatistical consulting. So it was a, a bunch of uh, biostats people that uh, 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 did a survey uh, on the biostats uh, communities and asked the uh, and asked the biostat community, hey, how many times someone you're interacting in like in your like a, a clinician or, or, or biologist, how many times uh, they were, you know, they were asking you to do or to, you know, things that are not statistically appropriate and so on. And the study showed clear evidence <laughs> that researchers make requests of their biostatistical uh, bi consultant that are not only rated as severe violation, but also they make those requests quite frequently. Uh, so it, it does. It does is the practice of science at the moment, right? And, and that's the thing that we have to think about and embed in our mind and think, okay, we, how do we do? What do we do to change that? So that's a, a classic. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Russ has shown that figure before, or you know, no, no maybe not. So classic, uh, sort of like you know, like a circle of uh, of research uh, where you know you uh, maybe you. Publish or you conduct, you know, you have a, an experiment. You, you generate some. Uh, you first you generate some uh, hypothesis. You don't control the bias very much. You have a low statistical power. You control. You collect some data. The data don't show very much stuff. You p-hack quite a bit. Uh, you find some stuff. You interpret after the result. After I've seen the result, you interpret the uh, the thing, and then you know you publish, and then you can you know do a, a little bit of a, a more uh, another experiment. And so, so that that sort of like a vicious circle of uh, you know and, and uh, you know increasing the uh, you know the decreasing the single to nose ratio of what we see in the literature is is uh, is the worry. So what are the possible solutions? So you have, I mean, some people are trying to think. Okay, p value point oh five is really too like a, it's not stringent enough. We should change that. Uh, we can use a Bayesian framework. Uh, we can do use prediction framework and so on. Uh, so that's the technical possible you know, kind of avenues. Uh, social, the social problem, I think, uh, is uh, even more important. And, uh, and you know, this, it, this problem is not like only technical or only social. It's like it has those two components. And if we want to solve for that problem, we have to think of those two components, you know, uh, together. So socially, like there was some uh, 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 journal that tried to actually ban the p-value and say, okay, p-values are so poorly understood and so poorly used, we just not don't want to have a paper with p-values in it. Like that was the, uh, uh, I think that was the some psychology journal. I can't remember the uh, our experimental psychology journal or something like APS or something. Like that. Um, there's uh, some journals that are doing uh, like a long list of uh, you know check boxes in uh, like a nature publication for instance if you want to publish in nature you have uh, like a long list of check boxes and things like that there's the uh, uh, nature also uh, sort of uh, is trying to push like uh, any paper that you know requires a bit more like a scrutiny on terms of stat or stats they push that to like a st proper statistician and I mean you see again the register reports are I think a really good solution. All those things could be implemented. It's just like there's an inertia, which is extremely hard to sort of move, and 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 and, it, and that's and that's the, the reason. I mean, we we have to think of why that's the case. So redefining significance that's an interesting uh, solution. Um, uh, it was like a you know. Uh, 70 prominent scientists work to think, okay, what is a good p-value? Like, uh, you know, 0 0.05 clearly doesn't give us like a, a strong uh, replication, uh, uh, you know, uh, rate. What is a good p-value? And um, they came up with like a 0 0.005 or something. Uh, and they, to do this, and I'll, I won't go into the details, but I'll just explain the, like the, uh, the principle. They look at a range, a very wide range of alternative to the null. And you know, then they model a number of alternatives to the null, and then with those alternatives, they can do a base factor, 
they can look at you know how you know how likely one you know alternate hypothesis is compared to the other, and with that uh, they, uh, they 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 conclude that you know p value is actually usually associated with a very weak base factor. Point p value 0.05. So therefore, like uh, you should use a p value 0.001 or 0.005 if you wanted to. So, so there was like a, some, you know, like a many prominent uh, people trying to say, okay, let's change the whole thing, you know, across the world, across the uh, the, the literature. And then you know, like you have other people like saying, okay, looking at that and saying, okay, that's actually not, you know, very useful. Like the p value that you choose a priori should be depending on your what kind of experiment you're doing. And maybe for some of the experiments, it's very important to have like a, uh, something which is you know, a, a low p-value. And for some experiments, it's not that important. And we, we need to adapt to the, to the actual experiment. So there's no consensus on that, on that problem. I think those guys are probably more, uh, uh, that they're, they have a better idea of, of the argument, I think. And that's the reason is because it's uh, p-value dep depends on the power and prior, and like the you know the, the results will depend on power and prior. The um, uh, depends on the h ones, which we don't know. Uh, priors are really hard to estimate, and, and and so on. And also that you know if you you know increase very high, you know get a very high p-value, a very like small p-value, very uh, stringent p-value, then you know you're going to not have much uh, you know chance in uh, detecting anything, right? It's a sensitivity problem. And you know, and then there's you know a whole dialogue between the uh, you know I have I encourage you to look at the uh, the whole dialogue between these two groups of people that it's very entertaining. Registered report, I think, is the is clearly one of the. I'm not going to go through the uh, because I want to go to the notebooks and uh, I don't want to keep you too late and uh, we have uh, dinner plans. But uh, <laughs> um, registered reports are. are I think an excellent, a truly excellent, not, not for any experiment, but like for many experiments, it is a critical way of thinking and it is the right way of, of doing a, an experiment. You, you have to design exactly and say, okay, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I'm going to test and how I'm going to test those things. You can always you know, like adapt if there is some things going on in the, re in the data that you require that requires to be adaptive to that. That's not the problem. But at least you define exa as much as you can. And, and that process of uh, thinking of exactly what you're going to do is absolutely critical and will save you a lot of time. It will save you a lot of time. That, uh, so it was um, pioneered and, and championed by uh, Chris Chambers. And, um, and there's a number of people that actually don't believe in that. Like uh, Jack Gallant is one of those, for instance. I don't know. And he, uh, he kind, of, kind of think, oh, I really hate paperwork. I don't want to be like, um, you know, each time I want to do an experiment, I have an idea. Like, uh, you know, putting that on the paper and, and actually putting that in and, and presenting that to my peers is, is really a waste of time. What we need is like a, you know, like a prediction and, and so on. So I, w I will go through quickly the predict the, you know, the things, but it's, um, you know, there's a very entertaining list of, uh, uh, of uh, tweets there. Um, and, and basically, um, I think, I clearly think that, you know, like the, uh, the, uh, the, I mean, you have to go for the arguments, but the argument of, of, um, of Jack is, 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 not, is not the right argument. Like, you, clearly, yes, we need a prediction value rather than the other p values. It's not like uh, we need to replicate rather than uh, to uh, and, and show each individual resource and that all those, f those arguments are right. It doesn't mean that uh, Pre-registering your actual experiment is not a good thing. It is an excellent thing. It will uh, save you a lot of time, and it will also uh, prevent, you know, like you know, and make make you make you in the right process of of doing science. And that's that's what the uh, so yeah, that was the uh, BSP was the the the, the journal that actually banned the p-value. Um, and even Nature editorial stated like something wrong, like you know, it says that closer the p-value gets, the greater the chance the null hypothesis is false. That's that's what you know, like you, mm, most of you responded as well, and that's actually wrong as well. So even the, even people like uh, writing editorial in, in Nature don't have the right concept of what is a p-value. Okay, so there's a report, Kobidas reporting best practice. All those things I think are you know good uh, good ways of uh, doing things. So uh, just to conclude, uh, that's you know like an introduction to the p-values and trying to sort of like uh, put in your mind that this is 
this is the, the way we're doing things at the moment is is have, has to change if we want to be efficient in the, in in the you know in the way we do science. So Yanidis um, said, you know, why? I mean, what? When are results more likely to be false? And basically, the sample size, the the sample, uh, the yeah, the sample size, the FX size, the smaller the FX size, obviously, uh, it's the more likely the the uh, H1 is going to be uh, uh, not publicated. The larger number of tests, and we do a lot of tests in uh, neuroimaging. The more trendy, the flexibility of our analysis, and we've seen the CARP study that you know they extremely, uh, we have extremely flexible ways of doing analysis. The more trendy the field, I think that's kind of important because the trendiness of the field is like uh, adding social pressure to you know like be one of the first and then therefore pushing things quickly, and the financial interest and those all those things are pushing to like uh, very low uh, positive predictive values. Okay, so uh, this was like an introduction, a bit too, probably too long. Yes, far too long. And uh, uh, now I want to go quickly with you uh, with a couple of notebooks. And, uh, and those things you will find uh, actually in two possible places. Um, they're on the hub. They're on the hub, okay. Uh, they're also, um, so they are free. Um, Three notebooks, and I will, you know, scan through them and uh, point to you to a, a couple of things. And uh, they are not supposed to. We're not. We're not going to go like uh, you know slowly across all of those. Uh, and they're also like a little bit redundant sometimes because I wanted them some of those to be uh, taken like independently of the other ones. So like uh, so you'll see that you know you'll have like a copy paste of like a number of cells. So don't don't worry about that. It's just to make sure that you know. Uh, most of the information is uh, in each of those notebooks if they are to be taken independently. Um, so uh, the first one uh, is, uh, I've called it evil p-value. Uh, ah, then p-values are not evil by themselves, but um, you know. So uh, this is our classic uh, import uh, matplotlib dot pyplot as plt uh, import numpy import scipy dot uh, stats. So that's uh, scipy dot stats is a is a good package in uh, a scipy, uh, which I, you know hopefully will uh, demonstrate a little bit uh, through uh, uh, those uh, those notebooks. That is a warning that uh, should go away once you have the uh, the right number the right version of the numpy. But uh, this is a uh, so I, mean, I just wanted you to like uh, you know, play with those things. I think it's it it makes a, a big difference when you actual actually like sample things and, and compute things and look at the results rather than just looking at you know the uh, a paper or like listening to me. Uh, uh, so just like a, a very like, simple exercise where you take to, you know you take a, you take a normal distribution and the way. You do you create normal variable in a, in a scipy uh, dot stats is to uh, is that so scipy dot stats is a SST here and then you create that variable uh, normal zero one okay so the mean zero variance one uh, create the sample size and the once you have that normal variable created uh, you can uh, sample from it and that RVS is the random variable sampling okay. so you give it the uh, the sample size that you want as an argument, and we create a sample of the number of uh, a sample that you wanted uh, of that normal variable, which is powerful because you can, you know, like uh, if I can easily replace that normal by any other distribution, and then you know, uh, I could say instead of like uh, you know, uh, instead of calling it normal, I could say distrib, I would call it distrib, and whatever that distrib, you can rerun the whole thing with a new distribution, uh, which is, you know, like a, it's a powerful kind of uh, objective oriented framework for that. Um, oh, interesting. So uh, let's uh, run that. Uh, so I've created that uh, sample mean, and then, you know, using an, a numpy, that's, uh, that returns the numpy array. Uh, you create the mean, the standard deviation. You look at the uh, the sample, and then you know look at you know this is the uh, uh, mean sample, and you know. 
And then the T value is simply the sample standard deviation divided by the number, the square root of the number of subjects as you, uh, or sample, as you know, and, and, and that's uh, just the T value uh, that you get. So that's just a little function defining this and, uh, you know, making sure that you get the same results. Um, and the p-value uh, is uh, once you've got that, uh, uh, you take, you take uh, instead of a normal distribution, you take a t uh, distribution, so the uh, scipy dot stats, t distribution, and sf is the survival function. Do you know what the survival function is? It's basically the function that will give you from the t-value or the z-value the p-value, right? So it's, it's one minus the cumulative function of, of that at that uh, number. Uh, so that's a that's a very like a, you know I really encourage you to sort of play with those, those package that package and and, and uh, you know that's a. So uh, I want to do this for a number of experiments. I take uh, you know twenty experiments. Uh, I take a, a, an effect size of 0.2, about 0.2, which I think is not a crazy effect size in uh, neuro imaging, uh, and uh, and an alpha uh, risk of error type one of 0.05. And what do I get? I get a couple of, uh, and I look at you know when, when my p is significant, and I get a couple of. Um, uh, significant experiment. So I've got a very f little uh, sample size, I've got a very little uh, uh, effect size. If I increase the effect size, you know, obviously I will get more, uh, way more number of, uh, uh, of significant p-value that's, you know, and, and so on. Uh, if I uh, increase the number of subjects, same thing, it will have a you know, square root of n, sort of like an effect. Uh, let's uh, take uh, the average, uh, say, or median uh, number of subjects in, uh, in uh, neuroimaging, and you got like maybe half of the experiments are significant. Now, uh, so just like you know, but if you do uh, take, you know, like, uh, you know, you have like absolutely zero, uh, zero effect size, you've got a number of only 12 subjects, you know, and you play with that, and you'll see like, you're, okay, this, this, in this run, there's, there's three experiments that are, you know, significant, right? And you know, this is, this is the, <laughs> this is life. <laughs> you'll get, you know, if you can take a, a, a very uh, low number, uh, low sample size, uh, you'll get, you know, something like that. If instead I had uh, 120 subjects, you know, I do have like one that is significant, but I, on average I will be, uh, uh, I mean, I, I will still five 5%, but uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, th that 5% will always be the case, uh, but instead uh, I will I still have like a, a, um, an effect size that I will compute, you know, it will be like a closer to the actual effect size. So, um, now, yeah. So how do I relate that to the bias and file draw effects? Uh, so that's the p-hacking uh, that I was showing before, and that's the uh, revising alpha thing that I was uh, telling you. Uh, and in that notebook, I've just uh, included those things. Um, and I shouldn't. And I just want to remind you of uh, what is the effect, what is the standardized effect, and what's the effect that uh, accounts for the sample size. Uh, probably you know, all of you know that, but uh, just, uh, so let's say the effect is like the change between the, the difference between two means of two groups. Uh, the uh, standardized effect, the coins D effect, uh, effect is the, uh, it's that difference divided by the standard deviation of the data. And the effect accounting for the effect size is that's not, you know that exactly the same thing, but divided by the uh, square root of the number of subjects, right? And that's that's two. Those two numbers are completely different, right? One is more like the like the, your, your t or your z value, right? And one is actually related only to the data. It doesn't. Uh, explicitly depend on the num of the sample, right? It's uh, like if you take if you take another like a 100 subject versus 10 subjects, you'll have a very very different t value because you'll have like a, a factor of 10 somewhere. Uh, but if you take uh, you know the uh, Cohen's d effect size, you'll have you know apart from the sampling problem, you should have something which is uh, about the same. That's, uh, that, that is, I think, you have to like, make sure that we have that in, in your mind. 
and it depends the you know will depend on the you know both the sigma and the effect size. But uh, you know, and uh, and, and in, in, uh, often you will see that a coin D, like a, a, a small coin D, is 0.2 or 0.1. A large one is one or you know 1, 1.5. It really has no bearing. Uh, that those you know is completely dependent on the field that you are and what you're looking at. You know, and, and you know if if it is the difference between the uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, the w thickness of like uh, one population versus of the uh, of the gray matter thickness of one population versus another it's you know it, it can be a very small effect size and uh, and still uh, you know be a, a very uh, important effect so so don't don't look too much at like when you look at you know the sum of those uh, uh, you know oh this is a point uh, you know five effect size it's small or it's big it really depends on the field Truly, I mean, you know, obviously, you know, the smaller, the, uh, the harder to detect, of course. Okay, so one thing I want to go through quickly with you is the notion of confidence interval. Um, I'm betting that most of you have seen that before, but I'm just going to uh, show you on, the, on this little experiment. So uh, the way you, you do the confidence interval is that you... Uh, you basically take your uh, sample mean and then you uh, relate that to like uh, if you take the sample mean and you remove the, the actual mean of the sample of the of the population of the sample, and then you normalize by the uh, standard deviation of that uh, mean sample mean, then you know that the probability of that number uh, to be less than a certain value. Uh, if, you have, if I take, you know, that uh, the t of um, at the at the p value of the 0.025 is going to be the absolute value. If I take the absolute value, so the, on both sides of the distribution, I double that thing, it's going to be 0.05. So that's uh, that's how you get to know where the actual mu, the actual population value mu here. Is bounded. Where is this bounding depending on uh, because uh, you know like uh, through that uh, that uh, sampling. So if you do a little bit of a, you know rearranging the math, uh, you you extract those this uh, this mu from that uh, formula here, and you look at you know what are the bounds here, uh, and that those bounds are the, the is the confidence interval. What's interesting is that you know the confidence interval. Is a random thing because it, you know, those bounds depend on the sampling, right? On the that's that's the random thing. So, so the the the, the way to think of the confidence interval is that you know, if I pick many confidence interval on average, like 90% of the time, I will have the confidence interval that is getting the the actual value of the population inside. So, which is a little bit of a again weird way of. Thinking of it, right? You would uh, rather have like a, uh, <laughs> a, a you know a more direct uh, thing of the uh, confidence interval. Okay, but but you know this is how this thing is computed, and it's uh, much uh, more uh, interesting to to display when you when you're displaying your results to display. Okay, what's uh, What's the confidence interval? You know, what is the interval in which there's 95% chance that my mean is actually falling into? Because then you look, you can look at, you know, that mean could go from like for the lowest uh, uh, bound to the highest bound, and you know, I don't, I don't actually know where it is in that bound, right? It could actually be outside of the bound as well, with a small probability. So uh, this is just a little function computing that uh, confidence interval. So you can uh, look at it. Uh, you can change the, uh, those things, uh, and then you know you can look at you know how many times do I find something that is. So in that case, I took uh, what was my uh, settings. So uh, I took uh, uh, n to be only 10 subjects, mu to be 0.3. So uh, you know the uh, sigma is one. So the Cohen's d value is 0.3, alpha 0.05, and then I'm computing confidence interval at uh, the 95% uh, confidence interval here. Uh, and you run those things, and you look at you know what you know what is the number of experiment that you've done. So I've done here, um, I've done like a thousand experiment, uh, and you know I found that you know like 
there's a, a, a 20 that are not in the, uh, the confidence interval, which is uh, you know when there, there is detection, and there is uh, about five percent that is you know outside the confidence interval again when there's uh, across all experiments. So I'm dividing those experiments where I find something and those experiments where I haven't found where I, uh, overall uh, because uh, because that number here is going because the confidence interval is computed under the, uh, the, the null, right? It's, a, it's actually, you know, it's a, it's a concept that you have to take under the null. When, when they, like, uh, so, uh, so it's a bit of a uh, weird concept. Um, okay, so, and if you have plot, if I plot those, uh, what I found uh, here, uh, uh, look, yeah, so uh, this is here the, uh, the true effect, the, so the, 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 the point three that I've put in the, in the, in the data, right? And this is the actual uh, effect size in blue that I've detected, you know, in, that, in, the, in those experiments that are, that are uh, I found some, like, I had a p-value of less than 0.05. And this is the, in green and, and red, the confidence interval of those things. So what is tracking, and is really important to understand, is that as soon as I detect something, most of the time, like a very large number of the time, I will have maybe not in that place, but you know, like a, I will have an, an effect size that is much larger than the effect size that is the true effect size, right? And that's because I've detected something. And that's because I've detected something with a, a small sample. So if I increase the sample, so let's say, uh, how many subjects do you want? How many subjects do you take in your, you know, experiment? 50? 20. 20? No, that's not enough. Like I want, I want to demonstrate. So, so look at look at that figure now, right? Uh, you look at the difference between the effect size detected and the, the true effect size. The true effect size, the solid line here, and the detected effect size, right? And the difference. Uh, is you know uh, is quite large. Uh, I think where do we have that? Yeah, got that. Yeah. So I've got uh, you know the um, the average uh, detected effect is 0.68. Yeah. So it's uh, more than twice the uh, the actual effect size. So now if I have like a, let's say a reasonable study with 100 subjects, what is going to happen? So first of all, I detect plus uh, many more things, and secondly, because my sample size is higher, the detected when I detect something, I've got more power, so I'm going to detect uh, many more. But I also, I'm going to detect something that is much closer to the actual effect size, right? So this is one of the UNEDs sort of like a, you know a, the button et al conclusion that I'm demonstrating here is when you have like a 20 or 30 subjects. Whatever you find, you know, most, most likely is going to be way overestimated compared to the actual effect size that is the, the, true, the true thing that is, uh, you know, over the population. Okay, so is there any question? <laughs> I'm, I'm talking and you're not uh, interacting very much. I'm getting scared that, you know, <laughs> that your, the, the message may not uh, go uh, uh, well. So any, anything, any... Any feedback on that? Uh, is that so? First of all, is that surprising to you? Is that something that you've seen before? You understand? You, you knew? Or is that something that you know? Oh my God! I mean, I, I haven't realized that. Who who was who has learned nothing like uh, in terms of like uh, that? Oh no, okay. So you, oh, maybe maybe if I ask uh, who has not <laughs> who has learned something, then we have the same answer. But, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah. So so if that's surprise if that's surprising to you, that's that's good. Uh, it's it is important that you play with those things and you play with the you know what's the, those 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 effects. Um, I'm going to go through quickly. Um, maybe the the power notebooks. How many, how much time do you have? Like a uh, I guess three minutes. Three minutes. <laughs> Good. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the power notebook, but um, uh, uh, what I'll do is um, just show it to you. Uh, 
I'm going to show it to you. So there's a, some repetition of what uh, you know we've seen before. Uh, again, so that those notebooks are a bit. Um, uh, I'm going to show you only one little thing. Um, I have. Uh, I read a paper. I found that the offer has a p-value of uh, 6.6 .6 to the power of minus 10, and they had 733 subjects, and that's an actual paper with the uh, FX size, the OPE, uh, on the uh, FX size on the epochal volume. The, uh, uh, how do I know? How do I have an idea of the? Obviously, the FX size is not reported in the paper because you know people don't report FX sizes very often, and, you know. Don't ask me why. That's you know within the checklist of uh, the Kobitas things and so on. But still, you know, there's a large uh, you know uh, there's uh, this cultural shift has not been entirely. Uh, how do I know what's the effect size there? Well, you know, an estimation of the effect size, and uh, you know, because you know, like uh, any, how do I compute that? Who, who would know how to compute an estimation of the effect size, the Cohen's D effect size, for, with those two numbers? No one? You could calculate what the minimum would be, like the minimum effect size that you need to get that divided with that Right. So yeah, and you're close. Right? So, what, so the one way of doing it is you, you're thinking, OK, Let's imagine that this is a p-value coming from uh, a z-value. So you can you have a one-to-one -one mapping from a p to z, right? It's uh, you know if you know the distribution. So let's say I have a distribution of a uh, you know normal one uh, zero one. That p-value under the null like it would be like a, a z-value uh, of, of that of that size. Okay. Now uh, if I divide that z value, and that's under the null, so it's, it, that's you know, an assumption. Um, if I divide that by the, uh, so I've got a z, I basically have a z value, right, under the null. Okay? So that z value is, you know, maybe, you know, it was computed under the null because the p value is computed under the null, right? And that's why I'm taking the, the null to compute the z value. So now I've got the z value, I can, I know that, you know, the, the difference between the fx size, the Cohen's d fx size, and the z value is just the square root of n. So I take the square root of n, and I look at the, uh, the z value divided by the square root of n, and I've got z equals 6 point something, and the d, the Cohen's d, is, cool, is, is a, a 0 0.224. And that's actually a visible effect size for that, that I've been like seen again in in other papers uh, for that. So it's just telling you a little bit of uh, how do you, you know, try to get an idea of what is going on. Uh, you know, when you just see a p-value, which you should not, you should have like the p, the confidence interval, the effect size, all those numbers should be in that paper. They are usually not, but you do want to know. Okay, but what's you know what 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 is the what is it, what what does it mean like you know, to have that p-value right? And I think that's that's one way of uh, of uh, of going about it. Um, yeah, uh, there's in that thing there's a, there's a lot of uh, experiment to play with power uh, that I'm I'm not going to uh, demonstrate. But uh, if you want to play with that, I think it's uh, usually useful. Remember one thing about power that you need. Uh, you need four things to understand power, right? To oh, where is it? Power depends on four things. So the FX size, non-standardized FX size, or the sigma, the sigma, the actual the noise, or the ratio of those two things, the number of subjects, and the risk of a, of a, and the type one error risk. Yes. Sure. No, it does not. What I'm doing is I'm correcting the z value is heavily dependent on the sample size because you basically take an estimate of the standard deviation of the data and then you want an estimate of the standard deviation of the average or the, or the mean 
of, of the average of those data. And to get that standard deviation, you divide by the square root of n, right? Now I'm doing the reverse impression. I know the, I kind of like know the z value from the p value, and then I want back the fx size. And therefore, uh, I'm doing the opposite. Yeah. But thank you for the question. Yeah. So, um, yeah, remember, remember that uh, power is uh, tricky because basically you have to define the alternative hypothesis. You, and you know, and that's not always the case. You don't, you, and, but it is absolutely critical, absolutely critical to have an idea of the power. And therefore, it is critical that we get some effect sizes, even if they are inflated, because there's, the sample size are, are low sometimes. It is critical that we get an idea of the effect sizes. Because that's the only way we can actually have some reasonable power analysis, right? Uh, so I hope I'm going to stop here. I hope I have at least you know sort of tickled you uh, on those uh, on those uh, those little things. Uh, I know that uh, machine learning and deep learning is way more attractive and things like that. Remember, 90% of the you know, papers and things are still, you know, unfortunately, sometimes using some uh, very, you know, those those technologies, and you really need to make your head very clear of what you're looking at, and you know, and, and what those things are, and how, if you have to use a p-value or if you have to do a power analysis, so that you really understand what's what's going on. To make sure. yeah. Thank you for your attention. And there's a third notebook about uh, positive relative value that actually derives, if you are interested, to derive the how Yonidis comes with that you know, formula. And uh, it's uh, you know, interesting to see uh, how that's done. It's, uh, yeah. We will understand from the, from, from the inside. <laughs>